Okay, welcome everybody, good afternoon. My name is Florian and we are kicking off our ISRF series for 2016 today. For those of you who don't know it yet, ISRF stands for Information Systems Research Forum and for the last few years we've done it in this panel format, so we ask three or four people to come in, talk about the same panel with the hope of encouraging a vivid discussion among the panelists and also with you, the audience, which worked pretty well so far. <coughs> Today's topic is very dear to me. I just submitted the first draft of my introduction chapter for the PhD and it contains the word mechanisms as well. So I hope I'm going to learn something here. Um, so the idea about mechanisms is that but our panelists are going to talk, tell you more about but the reason why we do it here is we were discussing over the last few years what sort of research do we want to do in our group. Everybody else seems to be shifting towards quantitative, big data, etc. What can we as qualitative interpretive researchers do? And we had this paper by Chrysanthi a few years ago where she described social mechanisms as a potential alternative. And as you may remember, we already had one panel here about this paper. We, we're doing another one, not because we run out of ideas, but because we have the specific question to look at today. What is the difference or what are the similarities between the concepts of mechanisms from a few different perspectives? It's particularly the one that presented compared to critical realism, which has this idea of generative mechanism, which sounds very similar, but may or may not be. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. So the order of speakers, we're going to ask everybody of the panelists to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, so that in the end there should be plenty of time for us to discuss. And we're going to kick off with Crisanti, who is going to talk on mechanisms as elements of experimental theory. And then Crisanti is going to introduce the other panelists. We're going to continue with Ola Hendrickson, who traveled all the way from Warwick, so we're very glad to have him. And he's going to talk a bit more about the critical realist perspective. And then in the end, we have Peter Abel, who's an emeritus professor from the Department of Management in the Group of Managerial Economy and Strategy. And he's done a lot of research on mechanisms as well. So I'm looking forward to see how that plans in. So thank you all for being here. Help yourself to tea and coffee. It's an informal event, so feel free to stand up and grab some. But also, yeah, pay close attention, and I hope we're going to have a lively discussion in the end. Thank you, and over to Presenti. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you for organizing this. And uh, let me say from the beginning that it's meant to be, this is meant to be very informal. Usually, when I'm invited to uh, a panel discussion on the ISRF, I don't have any uh, uh, transparencies because I like the discussion. There is one reason that I have transparencies today, that's because I have a couple of diagrams that I hope will feed up some discussion. Uh, although Florian said that somehow for the information systems community, it was a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, which uh, started discussions of this, uh, of this topic, um, my presentation and my understanding and my discussion of mechanisms is very clumsy and I'm sure it is the more clumsy of the three. I came into the issue of mechanisms that is explanatory research, causality in particular, um, from uh, somehow noticing at some point the amazing work that Peter has done. So um, I really declare from the beginning that I'm very amateur of that, I'm searching, and I, have, um, I, I very much treasure the opportunity that I will hear Peter's argument to my clumsy kind of uh, presentation. Now, in relation to that, of course, there is the work that is done in a much, much better way exploring um, uh, and developing theory from the critical realists. And in that respect, Ulla Henfrisson, who is an IS professor um, and he started his career from Sweden and uh, it was from there he developed some extremely interesting research on IS. Uh, very much my own interpretation of your work and tell me if I'm wrong, but very much 
much merging the engineering perspective of interests of information technology within the social uh, context and organization of the Nigerian issues. And within that, um, uh, uh, Ulla is really uh, a master, much, much better than I am, in uh, framing research questions and developing uh, theory. And with great interest, I realized at some point that he published a paper on uh, explaining uh, a phenomenon, an IS phenomenon, with, uh, uh, on the basis of critical realism, very much tracing generative uh, mechanisms. Now, my own story, as I said, is uh, I just came across mechanisms and I thought that this is very much worth exploring. For those who don't know, uh, I am an interpretivist information systems researcher, very much trying to understand the, uh, and explain socio-technical phenomena, that is what happens with information technology in organizations and larger societies, taking into account uh, uh, the environment, their environment, the environment of organizations within which uh, innovation, technology innovation occurs. And Within the interpretive tradition, we very much uh, use social theory uh, and uh, do case study research. Um, we usually have a narrative in the middle of our papers and our books, and then we try from that to derive uh, theoretical uh, propositions. And I grew more and more unhappy with this kind of research in the sense that it uh, ended uh, invariably very weak propositions. And very often, um, or, or invariably, the students, uh, uh, the, the students of this kind of phenomenon, the authors, are very familiar with that. And they justify or they present right from the beginning their research as exploratory. So um, they draw from, uh, uh, from large theory, from ground theory, they uh, search for empirical evidence and they make proposition relevant to information systems phenomena, that is technology and socioeconomic change phenomena. That I would call substantive uh, theoretical propositions, not contributed to the ground theory, not contributed to epistemology, but they contributed to specific phenomena, for example, what happens with information technology, say, in the government sector or in my case, in the government sector in uh, developing countries. So much more specific, context dependent, and trying to explain um, uh, the, the unfolding of phenomena related with information technology. So as I grew very unhappy with uh, the contributions that we make collectively, myself and other colleagues, I was looking for what is missing, what could be strengthened, and I realized that one of the things that we were very, very shy and tried to avoid was uh, causality. Now, causality in interpretive research is a tricky issue, but I was bold enough and naive enough to say, okay, I'll have a go. And at that time, I came across uh, the mechanism um, uh, idea as a way of uh, developing causal explanation. So explanatory research is my interest, that is uh, research that answers why and how questions, and uh, if you look, the uh, philosophy of uh, science, epistemology, gurus, etc., that uh, can be done uh, either by having a ground theory and fitting the phenomenon in the ground theory, which isn't that very satisfactory. We did this quite a lot. As I said, we tend to start with big theories, but no big theory is so satisfactory. We tried to develop more substantive kind of theory. Therefore, we also drew from empirical studies. Now, as far as drawing from empirical studies is concerned, that brings us to the different, the second type of explanatory uh, theory propositions which is to identify the underlying causal associations and processes. So that's where I am. That's the kind of research that is of interest to me. And uh, for that, if uh, you go back in the history of uh, technology and organizations, information systems, 
you will find the seminal paper by Marcus and Roby, which uh, uh, identifies two different types of research, the various research, where causality is kind of uh, uh, proposed on the basis of statistical associations, statistical inference, and uh, the process research, which is much closer to what I have been doing, my colleagues have been doing in this department and most of our students, where we are trying to find the logical links between initial conditions and outcomes. Okay? So the, it's the tracing of the causes that lead to the outcomes given some initial conditions. Now that's where the, um, the, the social me mechanisms fit. <coughs> By the way, quite a lot of the process research in information systems and management more generally is not causal at all. You might have a process model which presents sequence of events or activities over time, but just presents an order over time. There is no claim or no effort to find a logical link of the final outcome with the initial conditions and what happened in between. But in order to do that, then uh, for that, I, uh, I discovered that there is all this body of uh, uh, research and suggestions of social mechanisms. Social mechanisms as a way to construct causal explanatory theory, in uh, my case, in uh, information substantive IS research. Well, social mechanisms. That social mechanism is a phrase used in what is uh, called analytical sociology. And that's where I started from, although you will see very quickly where I started having my problems and I still have unresolved problems. The question therefore is, how can you identify these kind of explanatory processes, which is the social mechanism, when you do research in the kind of phenomena that uh, I do? More specifically, at that time, that's five or seven years ago, the kind of issue that was bothering me, the kind of research that I was doing, give you an example, is I was trying to explain why, how did it happen, and in Brazil, um, the electronic voting uh, system that they introduced became well accepted and successful, given that in most of the rest of the world, electronic voting system is something that either is not desired at all, or when it is introduced, it causes problems and it is abandoned, or it continues causes, uh, causing problems and citizens are aware of that. So I was trying to explain um, why it was successful in those particular circumstances. So, for this, I had my own kind of theoretical baggage in the back. And definitely I believe that we all start with <coughs> research not as tabula rasa, not as going to the field and not having our theories. And it is very important that we are aware of the foundational theories. And in particular in information in the field that we study, there are two foundational theories that are extremely important, what I call theory of action, kind of structuration or variation or rationalist theory, and theory of technology the relationship between artifact and uh, human actor. So we all have of that, and as I said, that was a little bit the beginning of my dissatisfaction, that we tend to battle with at that theoretical level rather than develop theory that we are happy with at the substantive level that uh, explains specific phenomena of uh, technology innovation. Therefore, I was interested in tracing in empirical cases causal processes that bring about the phenomenon that uh, I observe in any study that I do. So, so social mechanism is supposed to be this kind of um, the missing element that, uh, and there are three things that I uh, describe here about social mechanisms. They are sets of entities and activities that produce change from an initial stage to observed outcomes. They are the building blocks for the construction of causal explanation of social phenomena, and they are, assuming that you understand the initial conditions and you observe the outcome, it's the uh, middle bit, 
So it's the intermediate logical links by which uh, those uh, observed outcomes uh, are achieved. This is vague and raises all kinds of questions. Among them, there are questions about how do we find them? Are they observable? Uh, observed? Probably not. In which case, how do you trace them? How do you detect them? Even if you find a few, how complete is your explanation? What is missing? And more importantly, where should you look at? I suppose that is determined quite a lot by the uh, ground theories that about the phenomenon that you start with. Um, but it is this identifying the, the, those links that has uh, uh, bothered me. I have here a few other things of what they are. Process that link causes and effect, comprise sequences of actions and events unfolding over time. That is, it's a process. And um, yeah, I mentioned already uh, that there is an issue of uh, generalization. Generalization and tracing them. But I want to mention uh, what really has been bothering me more than anything else. And what is bothering me is starting with uh, the various uh, uh, the diagrams that show where do you look for identifying um, uh, the, the causality, the mechanism. And this is a, from, uh, as I told you, I started probably from the wrong place from what I was doing, but still it's extremely interesting and thought-provoking how satisfied you are and where you should look for an explanation. So I looked at analytical sociology, Das Coleman, which has this kind of diagram. If you try to explain a social phenomenon up there, then the immediate thing that unavoidably, according to this, explains that is individual behavior. Lots of individuals, and therefore it's the attribute of individual behavior that explains that. Of course, individual behavior is affected by the environment, which is of interest to me, and it is that, therefore, that the social situation develops uh, or, or makes people, individuals develop beliefs and desires, etc., that shapes their attitudes, and then there are a number of psychological mechanisms to, uh, uh, that lead to specific individuals' behavior. That, for me, is something that um, may be true, but isn't helpful for my research. I'm studying phenomena such as why the electronic voting system in Brazil succeeded. There's no way that we can explain it in this kind of way. You are lost if you're trying to trace the psychological mechanisms. Actually, a lot of research in trust is exactly that. It's trying to explain <coughs> attitudes of people towards a situation. Do I trust them? But that's not very helpful for me. So I'm much more interested in linking this individual level mechanisms with environmental, contextual situations. Therefore, sometimes I'm here. I'm trying to explain the phenomenon here. Sometimes I'm there. Sometimes I'm at the very top. Where do I look for mechanisms and how do I trace them? Perhaps today, I drew that actually a couple of years ago, and today I dusted it and I looked at it again. And it occurred to me that probably what I need to add here is another thick line between those levels and individuals, and then coming back again. But at what level do you focus? And therefore, what form does the mechanism that you propose for explanation takes is something that, for me, remains an open investigation. And I will leave it here, because there are people who have done, as I told you, much better research and thought much more about that. And I hope I'll learn. So, I'll switch this off. Otherwise, we'll hand over the
we wanted to ask them, you know, but of course you can't just, uh, you know, write a paper about, uh, well, we've seen user, when you, you know, user adoption is very important. We've, we've seen that, you know, innovation is very important. We've seen that um, growing the scope of the infrastructure is important. Uh, uh, but how would you, what is it that drives those? I mean, these are outcomes, uh, outcome variables in a, in a sense. Uh, so what, what is driving those? And, and that's, uh, when asking that question, uh, you know, led us to the mechanism uh, uh, concept, and we ask ourselves, you know, which which mechanism contingently cause digital infrastructure evolution? There's a certain uh, point in saying contingent here, because I think that was partly you know what attracted me in, in Krieger realism. At the point, yeah, it should be very this is very conventional in that sense. When I came to this paper and this study, I didn't know much about Krieger realism at all. It's my co-author who knows very much about. Krieger. And uh, so he was fascinated in, in, in um, the philosophy. I was, uh, you know, fascinated from primarily in, in digital infrastructure evolution. But that, you know, but I saw early on that, you know, there would be certain elements in, in crude realism and, and their way of thinking about mechanisms that, that was appealing. Um, and uh, part of it is, is that, that contingency. So what is, uh, let me see what, so what is generative mechanisms? Well, you know, I haven't got so much to say about it, but I think I have a few things to say which I find very appealing, if I, you know, which is, uh, well, it's causal structures that generate observable events. So essentially, you start in, you know, in, in an event that you that you try to explain uh, that would be an, uh, interesting in a sense and, and see how, you know, what would be the underlying causes then. And, uh, causal structures uh, with this kind of view would, uh, it's not, you know, what's, what's really appealing is really that uh, something has a, a mechanism in, in the trigger realism would have a, a causal power to actualize a, a certain event. So it has the power to, to, to cause this. It doesn't mean that every time it will, uh, because there will always be certain uh, conditional, uh, contextual conditions that uh, you know need to be in place as well. You know, or, or could uh, counteract. So this kind of thinking you know, uh, was very appealing. Also, when I look through you know different uh, previous studies, those exploratory studies, and, and many of the very good exploratory studies, you know, in the area, you could, you could also tell that it seemed like even though the same end result was there. It seemed that there were a different, different, uh, a number of different causal paths. So that was also very appealing. The fact, you know, that this is, can be accommodated within the, the you know, uh, the notion of continuing causality, where uh, you can um, uh, you can speak about equifinality. The fact that there is, you know. The same outcome can have a number of different causal paths, you know, depending on, on certain uh, conditional uh, conditions. Well, coming from uh, uh, you know perhaps from theory originally a very interpretive, uh, uh, for some reason I just felt that this was uh, um, a way of moving forward, at least for me in my own research. But but I felt also that that the uh, the discipline. Uh, Partly needed um, so some research in this direction. So uh, I think uh, what to say about the consultant then in in, uh, in this thinking is rather that it's contingent uh, and uh, it has the power to actualize the events, but it, so it doesn't necessarily mean that every time it, it actually will. Uh, we made three assumptions about mechanisms of digital infrastructure in our specific studies. I'm, I'm telling this from the study's point of view, in a sense, just to give you context, uh, because I've been um, quite oriented to doing more substantive uh, you know, theory stuff. Uh, well, one of the things that we assume is really that uh, infrastructure mechanisms would be self-reinforcing. That's part of that, uh, you know, it's been described in, in, in many previous works as something that is, you know, the reason why you call it infrastructure is partly because it takes on its life, uh, a life on, on its own. So there is a certain path dependency. Uh, so 
at the point that the infrastructure or uh, it's going in a certain direction, it's, it's quite difficult to, to break that path. So that is a certain self enforcement. It also uh, consists of, of a number of different elements, and, and uh, we're also saying that, and this is also coming from uh, you know this uh, the line of work that uh, uh, Trisanta in introduced, and uh, even think you have a paper actually in that in that book by uh, uh, Leo Swedish. I should really know it's him, but I can say it for you. And uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, uh, so that's the way we wanted to see it. I don't think I should uh, go into that too deeply. But what, what we wanted to look at upon them, because if you, if you read some of the work from, from people you know here in the room, um, there was a book uh, called From Control to Drift that meant a lot for, for uh, so means a lot, I think, for, for, for people here, and uh, it might have done that even more so before, with uh, Claudio and, and Ulla Hanset and others. Uh, and what one of the core core notions that they uh, emphasize is really that while if, if you try to control infrastructures, they will never be successful. So that was one of their, uh, you know, I think it was a core message in, in that book. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do here is also to, you know, more, more critically uh, look at those uh, Assumptions. That's also why you know we made two of the contextual conditions. You know, um, we, we we zoomed in on two specific ones uh, because the other one is really about the architecture of the technology, uh, which uh, so technologies that are loosely with with components that are loosely coupled are more um, prone to be, you know be able to adapt to to a changing environment. So we wanted to see, well, to test on the basis of loosely coupled architecture versus tightly coupled, and so on and so forth. Then we just assume that, well, can't you see, since, since uh, there's different dimensions here, can we see them, them uh, almost like a configuration? Rather than, it's not process, it's not variance, so it's, it's really, it's configuration. So we wanted to see whether, so do you need, uh, you know, a two, out of three of those, or do you need one of out of three, and why is that the case? So that was like our kind of very generic model there. Then we went to Norwegian. Well, we did we did already have the case study actually. So, but it's presented as we needed an extreme case. We needed a, a case where um, where we would be likely to, would be the biggest success. Of so we're sampling on the de dependent variable, as the variance researcher perhaps would say. But we're looking at the success case, and we're saying, you know, so which were the mechanisms that led to this? Then we wanted to take, do uh, a case survey, where we essentially uh, collected all relevant infrastructure cases around. Just looking at the data part, essentially, the case story. And to see and encode those, you know, according to, you know, without the, those mechanisms that we, we did find in, in, in that single case study, um, we didn't find uh, three mechanisms, and one of them would be the adoption mechanism, for instance, that basically says that, uh, you know, at the time you offer more services, more users will adopt, and more resources will, uh, you know, be attracted by the infrastructure. That will in turn uh, create uh, offer uh, offer more resources, and there is a positive you know self reinforcement of, of that. And that. So once you have that spin, you will have you know users grow. So that would be the adoption. In a similar way, we, we thought that well, there is all it's only adoption, it's only scaling, it's only innovation. Wherever you look in infrastructure uh, cases, this would be the three in in play. That sort of thing. And um, but we wanted to see whether uh, so. So do you need all of them? Uh, essentially, since we are, if you would uh, think of think of this in terms of set theory and in, in discrete sets, it would be like eight combinations. It would be you could have no one of the mechanism. You can all of them. You can have 
to uh, three and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we thought that, and that would be, uh, so essentially we said that, well, what we um, found was essentially that we only have two successful configurations, but they are very different. One of them contains innovation and it contains all the mechanisms and one contains uh, no one of them. And in the case of where innovation is involved, that idea about losing a couple of architecture and decentralized control are very important. But it's not so important when it comes to those successful cases with only adoption and scale. Uh, we shall, you know, which speaks against you know, some of the uh, uh, you know, previous findings and assumptions that have been around in the field for a quite long time. So that's the, the kind of uh, setting of this. So, uh, and I was planning to speak a bit freely, by the way, you know, I, found, I found that useful in a sense. Uh, I haven't dealt so much, you know, what, what I like about critical realism and please remember that probably a, a couple of you people are more experts in critical realism than I am. I'm just speaking from, the, uh, I'm, I'm looking uh, upon it more as a, I'm, I'm more a consumer of critical realism than I'm, I'm, I'm someone contributing to, to critical realism. And uh, that's all, it, so, so in a sense, uh, I find it appealing to think about that there is a real world first of all. Uh, so there's a realist ontology. That's a, a, I like that starting point. Uh, and uh, it's, I like it because I flirted with other ways of seeing it, but uh, when I, whenever I think about my own life, and about my family, my kids, whatever, I think I really, uh, I, I think there is, I, I make like this, think that they exist. Yeah, <laughs> I make the assumption there is a real world. And I don't like it any other way. So I guess that's, uh, that's where I am. But then I like the fact that, well, on the epistemological level, uh, the world can, you know, it can still be very difficult to access that real world. So, uh, so we need to have, so, I mean, parts of it, uh, there is social construction. And uh, so, but just because it's difficult to access the world, it doesn't mean necessarily that the world doesn't exist. So, from that perspective, I'm thinking that, well, if there should be a point of doing research, I'd like to be able to explain, you know, what, what I see. And so, and I like that, the fact then that um, the idea that you would be able to uh, look at, you know, different uh, causal paths, uh, uh, you know, behind, uh, behind phenomena and so on. I didn't, I didn't go so much now into the details on how you capture the accident mechanisms and so on and so forth. I think that in this case, uh, I think that we saw this as a, it was more like a very, very nice way of structure something I felt we already knew, uh, I would say. It's just that when you did that, you also learned something more uh, on top of that. Uh, and uh, so I think it's more like the ambition of, of going, I mean, of course, we did in the paper say that we use the retroduction and uh, we, you know, it's a pretty, pretty, um, uh, pretty neat methods uh, section, I would say. But, uh, but as we know, it's also a way to rationalize, uh, you know, what we did. Uh, and uh, so I don't think there is any particular uh, straightforward way of, of uh, discovering mechanisms. It's just a, but, but a good starting point is to, to look for them in a sense and, and look for underlying, uh, underlying explanations. I think I'll stop there and, and we'll, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
terribly clear about what this panel or seminar is going to be about. So, um, I have prepared some notes here um, and I shall read from them. I assume that mechanisms enable an understanding of how one event or action, A, let's call it, causes another event or action. Indeed, the mechanisms are often formulated in terms of actions that connect actions, uh, and that, I think, is something I'll get more in a moment. So mechanisms are explanatory descriptions of the generative causal connection between A and B. And one of the requirements of a mechanism, so most of the philosophers say, is that there is no gap in the causal uh, uh, description of this. In other words, if you think of a mechanism of a motor car, you know, this cocktail, this cocktail, this cocktail, this cocktail, so there must be, must be no, uh, 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 no gaps. Now, I assumed that this seminar, as I know it was coming from uh, the Information Systems Department, which is not my, my department, um, I assume the seminar is focusing on situations where the lack of uh, similar comparative cases uh, of A causing B makes statistical quantitative uh, inference very problematic. I'm going to assume that, right? I assume that's what this, this seminar was about. If you want the shorthand way of saying that rather complicated sentences, we deal with one or two case studies, we don't deal with statistical samples. Uh, and the question becomes how can we uh, adopt the concept of mechanism uh, when we have no samples but only have one or, two, one or two cases. I think the way to approach that, well, the way I approach that would be to say, well, let's first uh, very briefly look at how it works when we have statistical samples, when we behave in a quantitative statistical, I would call it large n rather than low, small n uh, 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 framework. So I want to re just review very briefly, if I, if I may, uh, at the statistical approach to, to mechanism. The statistical approach to mechanism, which says it's searching for how A is connected to B, will always start with a pattern of co-variation between A and B. It will always, in the sample, find that there is a correlation between, uh, between A and B. Call it a generalization if you want, call it a partial generalization, we could, debate, we could debate that, but nevertheless, there, there has to be a covariation. Uh, that covariation requires uh, that uh, there be lots of cases of A and B and not A and not B, etc., to try and uh, find, find, find the, the, the co co covariation. What is the mechanism that connects those to do will do? Uh, we'll say, well, in some way, uh, let's uh, interpose another variable, let's call it M, or set of variables that are causally connected with no gaps, uh, which would uh, account for how A got to B. And I think that's quite consistent with everything that you, 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 uh, you, you said. So then you take M as observational and measurable. If not, it would be a theoretical term, but it would turn into theory rather than uh, observation. The basic idea in the statistical or quantitative approach to mechanism is that, in fact, I think, as indicated on the slide, there is no way of talking about causality without finding a generalization and without comparing cases. The problem in case studies is that there may not be comparators and there may not be uh, generalizations available the question then becomes, how can we possibly habilitate a concept of causality and mechanism in that, in that, in that uh, uh, context? Just finally, just not finally, just uh, for a moment, stay with uh, statistical met methodology. If we want to say how A is connected to B, and we postulate there's a mechanism N, that can be very complex, but there's a me mechanism N, then we can say that N is either an intervening variable between A and B, uh, A leads to M, leads to M leads to B, or we can say that M, in fact, uh, causes A and B. That's called a confounding effect or a spurious effect that would account for the relation to the co-variation between, uh, between A and B. Now this recently, uh, some of you might have heard of uh, path analysis and structural equation modeling. Uh, uh, this has recently been uh, largely overhauled in Interestingly enough, by information scientists, by Judea Pearl uh, in, in California, uh, and his book on causality. 
And what he's managed to show is uh, how we can take complex networks of relation, uh, uh, events and actions that are connected and how uh, we can decide whether in the face of consistent co-variation, we can make a further inference to causality. Because it's always important to re remember that causality goes be beyond uh, statistical inference. You must have co-variation, it's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition in the statistical framework for talking about a, a, causal, uh, a causal relationship. And the work that's um, being developed very, very recently uh, is under a delightful uh, title of the backdoor and front door effect. And I, I'm not going to take, take you through that, but I, I mention it because if any of you want to understand what's going on in the statistical approach to mechanism, then this, in my view, is the, is the, state, of, the, state, of the, the state of the art. Okay, but what would happen if only a few cases are available? In extremis, only one case. There are no comparators, and we're not going to locate a co-variation or generalization. And that was rather like your process. Okay? What would happen? There's no co-variation with it. How can we think of mechanisms uh, defined as things that enable to understand causality? We agree on that. How can we begin to think about mechanisms where there is no comparator and there is no uh, gen generalization? Now, quite a lot of philosophers uh, would say you can't. Uh, quite a lot of them would have said, and that was the, that's the hypothetical deductive of covering your model, you must, you must have that. I think that's um, not very useful to us, because I, I look at management uh, literature, I find that some of the deepest insights come from case studies and comparative case studies, and in a few cases not, not, from, not from statistics. Well, the basic idea uh, that, that uh, I've tried to develop, um, which is now called Bayesian narratives, goes something like this. We concentrate, let's take event A and B again, we concentrate how human activity, human actions and indeed forbearances, things that people could do and don't do, how human actions and forbearances generate that connection between, uh, between A, A and B. That was a little bit like the bottom line in uh, the Coleman diagram uh, that we had, uh, had, on, uh, had on the board, all right? I call the uh, desire to try and use the concept of causality when we can't compare and can't generalize, I call that ethnographic causality. It's something that we would want to do when we can't do that and we, we still want to use the concept of causality. So how can ethnographic causa causality be achieved in the extreme case where we've only got one example of A and one example of B. Now, what uh, my method of Bayesian narratives does is something like the following. Rather than saying we're going to derive causality from a pattern of co-variation, we try and search for direct evidence for the, co the, the causality. And this is often human activity, because in the human sciences, unlike the physical sciences, Causal, causal, causality is made by human activity. We actually generate or make, uh, make, make, the, make, make the relationships. If we, take that, if we take that view, then it habilitates the following intellectual approach to causality. It says, look, we can uh, try and find out from people using ethnographic technique uh, why they did something uh, in A and why that led to B. Now, that means that we can actually habilitate concepts of subjective causality. But what's more important, we can also habilitate uh, cases of counterfactual uh, uh, causality. If, if A hadn't occurred, then I wouldn't have done B. If A had occurred, I, because A occurred, I did B. So the idea is that we try and use subjective counterfactuals and subjective count uh, statements of causality as evidence for the unique connection between A and B without any generalization at all. If we do that, it then leads us to try and talk about the, how much evidence have we got for a causal link, how much evidence have we got against it, all right? We then talk about the odds of there being a causal link there in terms of the ratio of the evidence for it and the evidence against it. 
That's essentially an odd ratio, and it's basically within a Bayesian framework, because we don't assume any underlying frequencies or anything of, anything of that sort. So the concept of Bayesian narratives, which is the technique I've tried to develop to formalize this approach of ethnographic causality, uh, is, is, is based upon the idea of searching for evidence for a causal link, rather than in fact trying to derive a causal link from a pattern, pattern of uh, covariation. And I don't think this is inconsistent with either the previous uh, the previous, uh, the previous uh, speakers. I mean, I could talk more about it, uh, but that, that's all I wish to say. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, so as you see, I think we have three reasonably different perspectives on mechanisms, but then there is a lot of common ground, so it should be hopefully interesting to talk and discuss a little bit more. I think I'll ask the panelists about it. Any one of you wants to comment on each other? I have a question. I have a question uh, because I told you that's what troubles me, and I wanted to uh, have a question to to Peter. Uh, it seems to me it's a question to all uh, as well. But in a way, I know. I think I know the question from what they asked from all that. Um, my question is: uh, if we take measurements uh, of causality, there's no gaps in terms of being able to say why something happened because of uh, why B happened because of A. That I can associate with at that psychological level. But could we do that, or would you object to that, to try to do something like that at the collective level? Yeah, I could yes, I, yeah. because for my sense, this is fundamental. Or should we not call this mechanism? And another way that I could call it, by the way, and probably is more uh, faithful to epistemology, is to call it um, uh, conditions of possibility, the kind of macro level inputs. But I want to explore uh, how people who feel, you know, very much what mechanisms are, whether it would be a mistake to call the macro level influences mechanisms, and I should treat them differently. No. May, may I try and answer that? Yeah. I, I, could, I go, could I go the white door? There's some markers here. So if we take uh, the diagram you took, uh, which is six of these. There we go. Okay. All right. So we have the micro here, micro here. Let's all right, like that, and then back up to the macro. Uh, and you're interested in this this level here. Yes, or now, even more because there are uh, well, okay, well, In the current, the current diagram is not usually only it, you can have like that, yeah. and then you can have another one up exactly. here. Should, should, should have done it, okay? But let's just concentrate on this one for a moment. The, one of the key questions is if we think there is a connection between a macro variable and another macro variable, the outcome. If, if, uh, uh, does it really imply? Uh, that we've got to drop a level to the individual le uh, 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 yeah. level. Now, I think this is a big debate in the social sciences and goes back a long way. I mean, one, one view would say there is no causality here. What this, this causality is, is really dum da dum dum da dum dum da dum okay? There is no causality here. Why? Because, in fact, human beings make the causality. There's no, there are no macro connections independently of those connections that are made by individuals. That's one intellectual position. I'm sort of sympathetic with that, but on the other hand, from a practical point of view, we often want to look at this level. Yeah. Of course, it is possible that in fact there is causality here and causality here, so the relationship between that and that will be some combination of this mechanism yeah. And a mechanism, we could, we could put a mechanism in the middle, uh, the, 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 there if we want. And of course, we can go to the meso and macro, as I, 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 said, uh, I said a moment ago. So I think the big issue is whether the theory of um, institutional or macro level causality uh, must always, in principle, be reduced to uh, how people, if you want to say how, as I said at the beginning, how is A connected to B? It happens to be at the macro level. How is A connected to B? Well, it's connected because human beings make that connection, right? It's not something that's like gravity, no? In no. our case, it is more complicated because okay. it's not only humans, it's technology that we want actually well, to no, where I, it has that course, causal. I'm, rare, I'm superficially aware of that debate about technology being an actor. 
objects. My off, offer, offer may be read. <laughs> Tussle. Uh, what's the name of the guy, the French guy? Bruno Latour. Yes, well, he can't write clear English for a start, so, <laughs> so uh, we, we have a problem. We have a problem there. But um, uh, I'm, I think I'm nervous about making technology be other than a constraint. Uh, uh, of causality. I mean, I, I very much take what you say that all causal, all causal connections, in fact, are contingent. All right? You know, we strike the match. The match will, will, will only strike if there's oxygen in the air, okay? The, the, so they're, they're very complex descriptions here, the contingent, the contingent connections. So I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but, but I, I think the debate we should have is whether all macro level uh, type uh, mechanisms should be reduced to individual mechanisms. Uh, or if these were meso, of course, you might then say the macro to the meso, and then coming down even, even further. And I think that's, I say it's a debate that goes back to um, Durkheim and people like that, of course. Uh, I mean, Durkheim wanted to say, right, with suicide, rate of suicide in the society. Uh, something about society, okay, right? And he said, well, that's, that's, and this is critical realism, because what critical realism says is there are real causal relations at different levels. I mean, that's what the key, the key, the key assumption. So it says, that, it says that arrow exists causally, independently of this. As I, that's my reading of critical realism. If that's, the, if that's the case, then we have to try and unpack what we mean by that. Uh, I say, so critical realism is, you know, what, another way of saying is, uh, are these causal connections reducible? Uh, some people call this methodological individualism. There's all sorts of different philosophical jargon to talk about, to, to, to talk about reducing, to reducing down to this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking to you. Oh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. and actually, also thanks to all the panelists for avoiding jargon up to very high degrees. I think it was very clear and easy to follow for us. So, um, this is maybe a good time to open up to questions from the floor. Any point you'd like to? Uh, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, no, I, I have a doubt, and uh, I would be happy if we can shed some light on that. Because I, did, uh, I, I guess, for me, Rob, but I guess that here there might be two different ways. At least I, I thought I, I, I understood this debate on mechanism in a slightly different way. So I would like to, to share these two different approaches, and then you can tell me whether it's uh, it's me or there might be these two different ways to approach it. So at the beginning, so what what we what I heard is dealing with mechanism, especially as a device to extrapolate general results from uh, from empirical observations of uh, one or very little example. Uh, and so the problem was how can we generalize from that? Uh, however, the, the way in which, at least at the very beginning, I was intending the thing was different. And it was not really an issue of how to transfer the causal mechanism from the specific case to the, to the general case, but was on, on another dimension, and it was can we first uh, in, uh, define a theoretical causal mechanism which is there independent from the empirics and then check whether we can implement this pure theoretical mechanism within the empirics. So in this case, this is not an issue of uh, small cases, big cases. It's really an issue of uh, let me, I, I'm not sure it's, it's completely correct to say that, but it's more an issue of normative approach and positive and empiricist approach. So it's more an issue of, I've got a normative mechanism regardless of what is happening up there, and I try to see uh, whether I can implement that or if it works. Or the other way around is, let's try to explain a social mechanism by in an inductive way. So, I've got the data. So the, I, I guess that the, the key difference is that the starting, the, the raw material in one case is the data. While I was thinking about mechanism as starting from raw materials which are 
logical connections regardless of the data. Uh, what was the across? So it, is it possible that there are two, these two different ways to interpret it, or it's just me because that, that, that so is decoding it? It's very possible. Any <laughs> just one side issue, Professor. And the, you, you use the word logical as well. Uh, in the I think we need to be very careful about that. If relationships are logical, they're not contingent and they're, therefore they're not causal. So the notion that in fact there is um, you know, causal relations are logical is, 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 a, is a sort of philosophical misnomer, I think. But, okay. Um, I mean, I, essentially, if I understand you, I mean, cause is always a theoretical idea. Okay. It's never something we observe. In the statistical tradition, we find covariations, etc. In the process tradition, we find, in my view, evidence that evidence for causes. The cause is always uh, theoretical, uh, and therefore we can say it's operating here. You see, what would happen? It seems to me, in, in statistic, in the statistical modeling, you say no causality without generalization and comparative method. In the case study method, you say. I want to talk about causality without generalization and comparison. But when you've established, you think, a causal link, because you've got evidence for it and the odds are for it, you might then say, how generalizable is that causal relationship? Now, distinguish between the proposition that says how generalizable is a causal relationship and the proposition that says that there is no there is no explanation, causal explanation without generalization. And I, I think... I, I call it the trinity. I mean, the trinity being generalization, comparative method, and uh, explanation, shall we say, causal explanation. Positivism says, or statistics say, you can never, gen you can never find uh, an explanation without generalizing and without comparing. What case study says, I found an explanation here, how generalizable is it? So gen generalization uh, becomes post-explanatory not an integrated part of explanation, in my view. Is that clear? Uh, I was thinking about, uh, 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 yeah. for example, because you can, you, can say, you, you can say, I generalize something that is, but you are still talking about what is, uh, whether it's a single case or, uh, or the... But the other example for me was, you are trying to say what ought to be. Regardless of what this ought to is present in the reality or not. And this ought to be is driven by your theoretical mechanism. So if you're saying, for example, uh, in uh, four centuries ago, I think that we shouldn't have slavery, and there is no slavery in there, you can have a, a theoretical mechanism that justifies your conclusion, even though you do not have empirical data, because, for example, there is no state which doesn't have slavery. But I'm, is, so, that, is, that, is that controversial? We can have a theoretical statement that says we think A causes B. Therefore, if I'm right, A yeah, causes B. Now I'll search for types of evidence for that. There are just two distinct ways of approaching that. One is through cases and one is through statistics. And simplifying that's, that's what I'm saying. Sorry. So I'm sorry. I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Wondering whether the ought to kind of, I have a theory which suggests a uh, uh, causal explanation, and that's what I expect to find, is the case of explanation that is, uh, we fit the case within a ground theory, and therefore we sort of derive from that the explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not interested in that myself because for most of the phenomena we study, we don't have theories that, in a way, in a satisfactory way, uh, suggest uh, uh, explan uh, explanation for the specific phenomena that is substantive uh, things that I study. So I uh, need uh, a way of finding the explanation from the empirical, from the data. That's why, and my data is invariably, because it's context dependent, they are case study. There may be a couple of uh, uh, case studies. <coughs> Very often I start with one. Hopefully I get more insights if I have uh, more than, than one. But that's the kind of uh, uh, situation that 
that I study and most of our uh, researchers are studying. In that way, my starting point is the data, although I have loads of theory generally for the phenomena, but I'm not uh, 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 much explaining the things that I observe and I'm interested in explaining. In that respect, I'm searching to begin with for the explanation. And to a secondary effect, then if I satisfy that probably this is what is happening here, that's why, for example, the e-voting system in uh, electronic elections succeeded in Brazil, I am also thinking, all right, can this be generalized? In what way? Given that, there may be all kinds of different paths. And in that way, hopefully, by doing comparative cases, I might discover other paths and other things that happen under uh, different conditions. But definitely the way I'm interested in mechanisms, and I think it could work in a number of different projects, research studies in our field, is when we are really starting from the data. And the data are case studies. They are narratives, and they can become richer. And I would love to have more rigorous way of tracing mechanisms. So far, we do put a, a kind of ethnographic research, but in a very loose kind of way. So A, I think that we can do better by following more rigorous kind of exploration of the tracing mechanisms. And also, we do need to think about how do we go from one case to another. Always context specific in mind. Yes, so it, it's to explain what is there and not to superimpose on the reality what it's not there. That was my thought. Yeah. Superimpose yes. on what is there, what is not there, instead of explaining what is already there. And I think also it's one of the big interesting questions around the whole area how do we actually get specific mechanisms out of your data? And we should probably talk about it a bit more later on. But since we have two more questions yeah. lined up, I'll ask. Thank you very much to, to all the different perspectives, but I, I still have uh, a big question mark, especially when we talk about the data and the search of causality. That is, how can we talk about causality without having some assumptions about what, is, what we are searching and how we are searching it? So in a way, how can we detach the mechanism of causality that we are searching by the way in which we pre-assume the world is working. Because I agree with Ola. I'm somehow an empiricist. When, when somebody steps on my toes, you know, I feel the pain and that is there. But, and that is where that guy that speaks English with a very strange accent had a, a, a deep, uh, deep effect on me. It's comp I don't believe in one reality that is the same for everybody. And what I understand is that by making specific assumptions about how the world works, so, and this is very clear in economics, there are very clear assumptions, and then because of that assumption it is possible to infer from the data specific relationship and there is a causal effect between the change in the inflation and occupation and that etc etc but and that is more for, for our field information systems how can we search about one and that is the issue of uh, generalization but also how can we detach the causality that we may find in our study from the assumptions that we are using and that for me is, is start becoming somehow a problem. That the reason why I started doing certain research is because I didn't believe, I'm sorry, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the world that is the same for everybody. And that is why a specific approach to search and to explore the phenomena for me was extremely valuable. Because the more people are exploring the same phenomena from different angles or having this assumption, the more we understand, and I accept, and maybe the, here getting not even to the ontological, but not to the religious dimension, I accept that we will never understand that whole phenomena, but we will be better positioned, and that is why I like to try to develop theories. Now, the problem is that the more we are focusing on the discourse of causality without addressing the other layer, and I agree, causality can be at macro and micro, but 
When I talk about the other layers, what are our assumptions? Why are we searching for that causality? Our contribution can risk to be in the middle and not to add anything to what is better done by people that, by choosing a specific ontological and a set of epistemological assumptions, have done better. And we are just reducing the complexity of the world that we know is the problem of our field in something which is simplified and by trying to find generalization we are trying to find the treasure at the end of the rainbow. We are keep following and maybe we have to find other methods. I don't really see how can we, and then I shut up, contribute really to a I think to our frustration, that is to better understand this very complex phenomena by trying or by reducing the problem to the causalities that are making that phenomena without making a very serious challenge, and that is more at a discipline level, of what are the assumptions that we are making and to accept and to share that different assumptions are equally valid because, and that is my view, there is no assumption that can be better than the other if framed accordingly to uh, a proper academic discourse. Well, I mean, whatever approach you take to understanding reality, you must be clear about the assumptions you make. You talk about economics, right? The economists will, broadly speaking, make assumptions about the models they use that are appropriate in the statistical framework, because they very rarely work within a case study framework. If we talk about the assumptions that we would adopt in case studies, they're rather different. And of course, we should be explicit about that. And of course, we could have alternative viewpoints. And of course, we should allow alternative interpretations, and then they should dispute. And how you dispute? You dispute about evidence. And then you may say, well, you know, what evidence to you isn't evidence to me, so we can get into the nature of evidence. But uh, that's the scientific, the scientific <coughs> method, as far as I can see. Speaking from, from information systems point of view, and perhaps what I've seen as an editor too, uh, is um, you know, I think I totally agree with you. It depends on part of what you mean by saying assumptions here, but I assume you mean that, uh, that uh, a certain assumptions coming from the literature, for instance, in, in the area where you're, uh, you know, you're doing your research, or so it's almost like theoretical assumptions. Uh, so it's like prior knowledge that would be input in, in your process. Um, if that's the case, uh, I, I really agree. And if what, what you see currently in our discipline from people doing qualitative research um, and want to do it and want to do it very rigorously is that they do like a grounded theory study, for instance, where you perhaps make too few assumptions, really, you know, in, in terms of you make assumptions. Of but, uh, but, but if, if I should be, uh, I think we, in, in general, we don't use the case study method enough for, uh, you know, looking for uh, specific relationships that we might know is already there. If you just think about a few examples in your own area, uh, Antonio, if you think about it way back, I guess, if you think of infrastructure, for instance, you know, if you think about people, and, uh, some of the leading people doing that, Wherever they go, they see an infrastructure. They do. It's because they, they have an idea that this is the way uh, the world works. But still, they frame their research designs very open-endedly. And I think that their work would improve tremendously if they uh, thought that they would make a number of upfront uh, you know, assumptions, develop their research design in a way that would search for that you know that causal chain of events in a sense, or those in that, you know a number of them and so on so forth. To me, and if I, I may, can improve. And I, I'm not sure it's uh, it can. To yeah. me, it's more it, it's not the chain of events, but why they are searching that chain of events. Because to me, it's not for me a good piece of work. Now, I, I, I simplify to. Uh, focus on, on the point that we're discussing. It's not the one that methodologically is extremely rigorous and showing me a sequence of events. No, but let me... Let me it's the one that, ex that makes clear at the beginning 
what is searched, and I would say why it is relevant in, and that is where the literature kicks in to me, is relevant because the literature has not looked at this phenomena from this assumption. Yeah, yeah, but let me add then that uh, there is also a tendency that we, we don't select cases very well. Uh, because in a sense, you, you might want to, uh, you know, which case you actually choose will have a, a very great difference for whatever. The way in which you analyze the case will make a difference. And that is what, where I think we have a different viewpoint. To me, the case is not, and that is where I'm saying we are getting almost to the, obviously, a case is relevant to what you and what is the focus, but it's not the case a priori that makes it that a good case. Not sure we can all agree with that. Yeah. I think we agree on that. I think it's absolutely important to how you start. That is, what are your theoretical assumptions? That's why I clearly, uh, you know, if anything in the paper with all the faults it might have, at least you try to clarify that. I try to clarify that. But when you search and you do um, causal mechanism-based research, you do not try agnostically to derive mechanisms. You really absolutely need uh, fundamental theories which will lead you to look for certain and justify to the reader why you look for those kind of things rather than others. That's one thing. Still, however, by just having the theories, it seems to me you cannot, you do need to do something more, which empirically, you know, it really tortures the empirics to find out the whys. Once you do that, and you find that you're satisfied a little bit with some kind of context, case-specific explanation, then there is for me the other also, to my mind, much more puzzling issue of what do you do with that? Okay, you might be satisfied that in this specific case, you know why it happened, the way it happened. But, all right, if somebody is interested for that particular case, fine, you can have an interesting conversation. If somebody is trying to understand the world in other cases like that, then what confidence have you got that it might work there? So the issue of general recognizability is for me much more tricky than uh, your starting point, for which I have to say, just make it clear where you start, and um, uh, I will decide whether I'm willing to follow it or not. Can you move your light up and then you have... Maybe it's just um, it's more of a comment linking uh, how we analyze the data and causality. So from the two presentations, if I may, I think I saw two different approaches about uh, causality. Well, generally speaking, one more event of process, and then uh, with this presentation, if I understood correctly, and I probably misheard, I think you mentioned configurational configuration approach to mechanism, which I think is signaling the research question, which is which mechanisms, which to me sounds more of a set of mechanisms, and then you actually have nice diagrams, some mechanisms being yet, you know, where to work, some not being. So I was wondering if what if it's a if what what the similarities and differences of this configurational approach, which somehow resembles some variance approach to me, but thinking of mechanisms, to the process view of mechanisms. Uh, it's just more of a clarification. I, you know, um, if we, well, the people felt the same way. That's how I understood. <coughs> yeah. Do you, you mean to say that you thought the configurational approach is uh, quite close to variance? That's good. Um, yeah, probably. Because uh, I think based on the diagrams, I, yeah. I think it's quite different. <laughs> yes, yeah. but but then you say this mechanism had to work, this was at work. Uh, yeah. So so by comparing what is at work with what is not at work. This mechanism plays a role or a stronger role than the other mechanism. I was I just want to yeah, make sure I get the logic right. When you actually, you know, first of all, I, in that relationship, yeah. you, you can see different paths, I guess, a number of different paths, and you know, resulting the same outcome, okay. but it would be a finality in that sense. Okay. But of course, there is there is a, uh, there is an element of uh, uh, correlations. You look at correlations okay. in the sense over a very few few number of cases in a sense. So okay. essentially whether there is a causes there or not, mm -hmm. or just associations, is a matter of uh, you know justification. I mean you need to have a theory behind it that, that tries to explain you know why you would see that variance among those configurations. And um, yeah, I don't know if that satisfies with but I think it's in it's in 
important if you're thinking about um, the determination or the finality of the number of paths. Mm -hmm. It's important to distinguish between situations where you have alternative paths and situations where you have conjunctural paths. In other words, this, this, and this are collectively important to get this, all right? That's different than saying this, or this, or this would create that. And so there's quite a lot of confusion about that in, I think, in, in, in the literature. Could, could I just say one thing that, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm particularly moved to try and develop what I would call the theory of subjective counterfactuals and subjective uh, causal, causal statements. The problem with a statistical approach is even when you have an experimental design, is you take a unit of analysis and you punch it. You, you, you hit it with something, all right? And you take another unit of analysis uh, in the control group, like medical, medical, tr medical trials, okay? The reason you do that is you can't actually get uh, the same unit uh, to be both uh, administered and in the control room, okay? And therefore, what you do is you take a sample of these, you take a sample of those, you take the mean of these, the mean of those, and you, 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 you compare them. Now, the great beauty of subjective counterfactual statements is that an individual actor can say, look, I did this because of this, and I wouldn't have done this if this hadn't happened. So the subjective approach has a, an edge over the statistical approach if that sort of data can be regarded as reliable. That's, that's a big... That's a big if, I agree. But it does. It means that the counterfactual and the affirmative statement can both be uh, evidence about the same units of analysis. Therefore, you don't need to generalize or take averages across across the control group and the experimental group. Have I made myself clear? Yes, I stand over. I stand over. I felt I will comment to what Antonio said. I haven't been here. Why don't you? I can, I can. Uh, if there's no other questions, I can, because I think it raises an important issue. Mm -hmm. If I understand you well, Antonio, and I think Rishanti gets you quite well, uh, you raise one very important and internal question, if I may say so. There are two ghosts here, though, not one. The one is the ghost of empiricism, of crude empiricism, believing that data speak for themselves, but there is also the other ghost, of which you should also be careful, which in the history of philosophy is called the ghost of rationalism, which is the imposition of a certain pattern created in our mind, all through discourses, onto reality. And I think the most interesting issue in the case of mechanisms is how to be doubly sensitive and open, because it's true. The same data can support different interpretations. And that bespeaks the significance of the theoretical ideas and assumptions you bring into interpreting the data. But it's equally true that you can use theoretical ideas to cover over subtle things which you can uh, uh, distilled by being more open to what we call empirical reality. And this is a fundamental issue of research and we have to be on our alert for A, going into the Shaila and then into the Karaitis of the other kind of stuff. Between the devil and the deep uh, blue sea, as you say, the vernacular English. So that's yeah, the point I wanted. Yeah, just kind of because basically what I was trying to say before is exactly that. So my doubt was, are we defining mechanism as the uh, theoretical causality that just that tells us which data to pick, regardless of what we observe, or are we designing mechanism as still the causal mechanism that, given the data that we have, regardless of how we end up in this data can allow generalization. So that was exactly my point before. Oh. So is, is, is an empirically driven type of causality, this mechanism we are talking about, or is it or it's a pure theoretically driven causality which is there superimposed on the data? 
That was my mic. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I... I'm um, sort of unsympathetic to this, this debate, uh, personally. I think uh, in the practice of investigation, sometimes we behave deductively, sometimes we behave inductively. Sometimes we start with a, a question mark about data, we still have questions about why we regard that some data, I agree, but we do. Sometimes we behave the other way. So the best way is to say is we behave abductively. We move, move one way, sometimes one way the other time. And all we can do is be explicit as we can about what we're doing. If some Jeremy comes along and says, you know, this is all bollocks, uh, then, uh, uh, okay, you say, well, why is it? Why is it? Why is it? Uh, so, so bad, and you have a, you have a, you have a dispute with him. And I, I don't, you know, I don't think the issues go much deeper than that, <laughs> quite, quite frankly. So, to, if, you, if you look at empirically, it isn't that pure but at the same time, you do not look at your data completely agnostically as to what you mind. And probably we need to develop more of that abduction as a way that you do research in the sense that you are sensitized from something. You are making explicit for your reader, your audience, who is, to whom you communicate your, your results and your research. And then um, you need also to provide some basis of convincingness for what data you look and what you look for in terms of uh, the explanation from your data. So for me, it's not one or the other. It cannot possibly work in one or the other. No, 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 it's more. Yeah, but what, uh, is it what we define mechanism in the first or the second? Or it's both? It's so both. It's, both. it's the combination. Yeah. You, it's the search for the causality given some kind of assumptions that drive you to look for specific things for causality rather than others. So without empirical validation, there is no mechanism? There can be abstract mechanism, but it seems to me that there are, can be abstract causal explanation. But uh, when, uh, as a researcher, I need to, uh, to discover explanation. That's where the mechanism for me, or the search for mechanism is useful for me. You can't say there's no mechanism. You say you don't know what there is. All right. All right. We want to. Okay. So the debate is clearly heating up. I have three people lined up: Chris, Will, Sylvia, and the gentleman here on the left. Okay. I I wanted to be a bit more practical. I wanted to pick up on the very technical term bollocks that was used <laughs> now, because I think it's a really important excuse point. <laughs> No, because actually we Sorry, exist in a discipline, and I think part of the framing for this in information systems is that exact technical term, because <coughs> we exist where we have a dominant group of people who have a very clear mechanism by which they come to mechanisms um, through statistics. And then we have a qualitative field which has historically done very contingent studies and not made very strong statements about what it, it studies. And I thought, Uli, you know, maybe you're in a great position to comment on this because critical realism is one mechanism, using the wrong term, one means, one means by which to, to do that. But it takes a, an awful lot of effort and an awful lot of space in a paper. And I, I just wanted a kind of very practical question, which is, if we're going to write qualitative research and we're going to try to get it published and we're going to try to say something stronger, which may be a mechanism, then how do we do that without resorting to very heavy means like critical realism, which is great but dominates a paper and leads to a very uh, one type of thing within the frame of you know actually what I would like to do, which is do qualitative research that doesn't just say oh it's all contingent and this context is very very interesting, but I haven't really got anything generalizable to say because I can't generalize from a case study, which is you know where we used were ten years ago. But it's also not statistics. So I think you know every paper doesn't have to uh, motivate critical realism in the sense that you wouldn't need to spend like 10, 15 pages that wouldn't probably not work even if you're not publishing that paper. But uh, so in the sense, I mean, I'm coming to this debate and I'm coming <coughs> to critical realism as I've used it more as a consumer, as I just said. Uh, so. I'm not so deeply, um, it's just a, appealing from, and some of the core assumptions
quite appealing. So I would say that in some of my, my works that I wouldn't state that I'm coming with critical realist assumptions, I would still have those assumptions, you know. Mm. Uh, I would still rely on it in a sense. I think I've reached a mood of, and I think that's very true for some of the North American journals in our field, too, the four-star journals, if you think about the MI school and ISR. The qualitative work has been written up that way. And, you know, it, it's not, uh, I think there are very few examples of, uh, um, of qualitative work published in the top journals where you wouldn't see uh, you know, some sort of assumption about this element. I think you made that point in, in your paper, actually. You know, that there, there is an assumption. But it's implicit. Uh, but it's not, it's not made explicit. Uh, and I think that's the way I'm thinking about it, too. You know, I'm not necessarily very... Um, I don't think you necessarily need to state it, but it can be, it can serve your thinking about uh, the research you do, and you can sort of write it up that way. I think there is a tendency now that uh, the way that you write up a methods uh, um, uh, section, for instance, uh, would be more of a very focus on, on what you do, uh, what you've done, and how you reasoned, and what your assumptions were, uh, rather than uh, necessarily putting the labels on especially in terms of the, the philosophical assumptions, I think. Um, because once you do, you will, I mean, there, there's two parts of that. And one part is that it might take away a lot of, a lot of the focus from this substantive uh, you know, area you're trying to develop. A second is that there will always be some reviewer that loves methods and loves, uh, you know, debating with you on, on that issue, so it can be dangerous. Uh, I was trying to systematize uh, 90 millions of very dense uh, notes. I think we focused on uh, two issues here primarily. So, well, as we deal with mechanisms, uh, how do we know we're right? Sometimes, and how? So, how do we prove our point in a way? And how we generalize? So, I do believe over the last 90 millions, we focused uh, a lot on uh, how to prove our points. We've seen uh, several ways to get to that point. I'm still um, slightly, and that's the question that occupied Kiyosanti before, I still believe we can brainstorm a bit more about generalization. I personally entered the mechanisms domain fairly very recently, I recently started working with the Kiyosanti on the e-voting project, and I do believe especially while dealing with e-voting in um, developing countries, um, really led me to, to think of what leads to what, but also of the perverse consequences of getting the mechanisms wrong somehow, especially in normative terms. So I'm just wondering if we can brainstorm a bit more about generalization and what do we know about generalization from mechanisms? I know it's a big question. Well. First of all, I don't think we ever know that we're correct. Okay, I mean, what can we do the same? The theory have a, a theory, the theory <coughs> at the moment match up, uh, and this is the best we can do at the moment. As was said, said at the back, you know, you can question that in terms of its assumptions and all sorts of different things. That will always be the case, as far as I can see. So there's never going to be sort of golden period where you know we've got we've got everything absolutely right. But I, I think the important thing about mechanisms in uh, singular studies, in, 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 in case studies, is that um, the, the, the question of an induction, uh, the <clears throat> it's induction from a proposed explanation to whether that explanation is generalizable. And that's completely logically distinct from the notion that, in fact, I'm going to induct from a set of data a causal link. Those are completely logically distinct uh, intellectual approaches. The former seems to me to be the essence of the case study approach. And that's what I mean by it when I say that we invert the relationship between causal explanation, comparison, and generalization. In, can I put it this way? In positivism, we say there is no explanation without comparison and generalization. 
in the quantitative, quantitative uh, technique, we can say, this is my best guess at the uh, mechanism. How generalizable is this? So induction takes a completely different role in singular research than it does in uh, what we might call positivistic statistical research, in my view. Um, yeah, I think that's a very satisfy myself, but, and I'm much more interested in your first question, am I right here? I uh, think that I have an explanation here. Um, perhaps I can uh, sort of uh, do a sanity test in some similar case. So in that respect, you might uh, increase the uh, degree of uh, being satisfied with your explanation by somehow taking it and uh, seeing if under the same conditions, uh, under the same condition, the same theoretical approaches, you find similar uh, explanatory processes and similar or different uh, uh, output. But there is something else that I'm also very, very interested, particularly in the kind of milieu that we live in, which is that we may here talk about theory and explanation but we are probably an endangered species within academia. Because academia is going full speed in big data and uh, don't bother about explanation and theory at all, here it is, we can do everything we could, we had tried to do with uh, theory, even better, just by doing uh, statistical analysis or very tricky uh, inference. Or well, uh, dubious data. Of data, data, but yeah. therefore, I would be very much interested in somehow salvaging what I find essential for understanding the world, some kind of combination of mechanismic explanation, causal explanation, and the kind of statistical analysis that happens and it is going to become more and more dominant. So I would like to combine a little bit the two approaches that you, Peter said, but I agree with you, have been two unreconcilable, to a large extent, traditions in scholarly thought. And it seems to me that we may want to rescue the causal explanatory theory by somehow uh, linking it with what is going to become and is becoming widespread and more and more sophisticated. That is, to identify or <coughs> try to find the explanation behind the connections that are established through data analysis statistically. My colleagues in the economics department uh, think that um, the case studies are just uh, sort of superficial things that we just be able to get some sort of generated gen 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 then you know you've got hair on your chest. You then get down to the statistics. Okay, you 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 really. So that's why I don't do it. We really don't. The blunder, right? But uh, uh, that that sort of thing. But I, I, um, I say I, I think the you know I, I I think what well if we look at econometrics over the last sixty years. It's a period of massive intellectual development, right? It's also now a period of massive data development, okay? Uh, and if we look at the, the empirical models in the literature, then the average model explains something less than 50% of the variance in the dependent variable. Now, the question then becomes, what's your, what's your attitude to that? One attitude is to say, well, that's perhaps as good as the down we're going to get, okay? And we're not going to get any better. Another attitude is to say, the statistics will get even better, or the data will get even better. Uh, I think the alternative approach is to say, no, we're trying to falsely generalize. But, uh, we're trying to compare oranges and lemons too often. And in fact, let's get back to the oranges and lemons, but let's find a vocabulary that enables us to understand the causal processes in oranges and lemons, and then tentatively see how, how, how we can compare them and how generalizable they are. Yeah, one more question, like, not for quite a while. Thank you. Uh, it's actually two questions, but I'll try to be brief. Um, my first question is, um, 
when is our definition of mechanisms uh, specific enough? Uh, so at what point does your analysis stop? You could go from social, meso level, interpersonal level, even psychological level, as in your model. So when is a mechanism really specific enough? And should you ever continue to do any further analysis to further specify these mechanisms? Um, then the second question, which is a bit related to this, is that both of you, Paula and uh, Crisanti, came to the explanation or the, the interest in mechanisms by your dissatisfaction or even frustration, which I also share, with these kind of exploratory um, explanations. But to me, still, this analysis is also quite exploratory because you start from theory. So how can you really prove these kind of mechanisms? Is not not much more a question of um, descriptive versus explanatory analysis rather than exploratory versus explanatory analysis. These are my questions. Um, good questions. The first one, can you remind me, the first is proposed. Yes, yeah, so how specific should how the specific me mechanism be? It seems to me that how specific this is different from whether it has to be always be at the psychological level. Mm -hmm. It appears to be more specific at the psychological level, but at least I am sensitized to environmental conditions and I can feel happy that this is very specific mm -hmm. and I observe it and uh, I find collective behaviors and uh, it, it is specific. Nevertheless, um, what makes it a mechanism and how specific it is? How, what kind of process should I call explanatory causal mechanism? I agree with you. This is very much an art. And I am looking and uh, I would like to find more rigorous ways that what I feel can be communicated and be seen by others as specific and in that way I can communicate. I totally agree with you that this is an issue, and probably it is an issue more at the macro level, probably because at the psychological level, I don't know, even there, you know, intuition and things like that, how specific is it? It's not observable, it's full of holes uh, as far as conception, uh, concepts is concerned. But I am uh, definitely need uh, to find one, uh, some way better than I have at my disposal at the moment, and probably some of the methods that uh, um, uh, Peter is using more systematic kind of analysis, which is without that much ambiguity, can be communicated to uh, others. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, this is something that uh, we still need to develop. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, if we do, we'll be able to create more, I don't know, intuitively more satisfaction in terms of presenting uh, our findings. Mm -hmm. I think, sorry. All right. Uh, I think the question is really partly determined in, in conversation with the community of, of you know the discipline in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, uh, what we want to produce is interesting theories, and and, uh, and uh, so it's partly something that you um, you know partly would evaluate those mechanisms uh, you know against the backdrop of other other theories. And, or other explanations in, in that area. And uh, whether it speaks to um, peers in that area, it's probably at the right level, I would say. So maybe that's, um, it might violate perhaps uh, some of the, um, uh, you know, authentic work in, you know, in the area of, of, of philosophy, but, but this is partly, you know, we need to build better traditions of the building you know, building better theory within our field, and I think that anything that would work is allowed, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, probably that's very pragmatic, perhaps, but uh, uh, I'm not ready to the mechanism as a notion. I just uh, happen to, to find it useful in certain, but at the point it wouldn't be useful, I would try to search for something else. Yeah, yeah I mean, your first question is about reduction.
introduce psychological propositions to brain state propositions. My son is a neuroscientist. He won't take anything seriously unless <laughs> it's reduced uh, use the neuro, neuroscience pro, pro, propositions. Uh, so I think that's a big issue. But I think you know we, uh, that debate has taken place largely within the statistical framework. Early, earlier on, Dante asked me whether, in fact, we could take the individualizing approach, I'm advocating the Bayesian narrative, to, to, to the collective level, okay? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, a quick answer to that is, if we take propositions, uh, subjective counterfactual, seriously, I would have done this if this hadn't happened, I did this because of this, we could also take a collective, as they, in fact, con conjugate. We could say, we did this, we did that. Now, those are probably less reliable, but all evidence is in reliable. The question we have to try and develop is, can we, can we develop techniques for the reliability of subjective statements of causality like that at the individual level and the collective level? Mm. Can I ask a brief follow-up question, please? Brief one. Yeah. Okay, so the reason why I ask this, because these social mechanism approaches and generative mechanism approaches are quite different. So the social mechanism uh, approach, at least in the version of Hedstrom, Argues that these mechanisms com are composed of headstrong? Headstrong, yeah. mm -hmm. are composed of different components, which then you might think, okay, maybe we should also look at the relationship between these components. So, what I also wanted to get at is uh, of, of you thinking about the differences between social mechanism and generative mechanism approaches. Why one would be more useful or better than the other? I if, if we can think places in this Peter's way. Quite a close Peter Hedgehog is quite a close friend, and I disagree with him completely. <laughs> yeah, I'm not agreeing. I have to just question. Okay. But I think that what is different there, it's not a uh, mechanism of the role they played mm. and their role in explanation, is the theory of action. Mm. So, uh, really, uh, Hedgehog and a lot of uh, analytical sociology, Coleman, etc., have assumed a totally different theory of action mm. uh, from uh, critical realism. Um, irrespective of this, what I find attractive is a way of making inference, causal inference, mm -hmm. through mechanism, which for me is a very interesting alternative to statistics and to this kind of proposing and explaining and generalizing. Yeah. So there is, despite their different uh, theories of action, uh, the uh, way they construct uh, explanation and theory, to me, is the same. I think it's interesting if you look at the standard textbooks on uh, qualitative methods, Miles and Hoover and all and Yen and all these sort of, they're really mealy-mouthed about causality. I mean, they, you know, they really don't, so, so, so much does it come on to say, causality is not, you know, we don't use it, it's an empty, it's not a useful concept to us, okay? Uh, but if we want to use it, uh, it's really not clear what many of the, and they use all sorts of surrogate words like, you know, not exactly cause, but influence or, or something, something like this, all right? So you never quite know what's really going on. And QCA, the QCA analysis, the causality issue there is, is very problematic. It is problematic. Nevertheless, uh, I guess if you frame your uh, explanation in a way that uh, provides some use for causality, then it does provide a stepwise, uh, um, I don't know, satisfying yourself with the sanity test for generalizability. No. That it transfers it to other cases. No, 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 no absolutely. It does. It's, 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 it does bring modest comparison. Yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. Okay, so before we wrap up the official part of the evening, I had lots of questions coming in and wanted to ask them as well, but didn't get the chance to, which is a good sign, because it means that you, as the audience, participate. But I do want to ask one question, and it goes to the audience, and especially to our PhD students, which is what do you make of this, and what are your plans to use generalization in your own research? Feel free to give any quick statements. That proves more challenging than you thought. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's kind of like it somehow dawns upon me that after now being here for a few years, whatever I want to write in my PhD, I can believe it. That everything is. It always can be questioned in a way that this is not true. Okay. It's relative. Everybody else is done for. Okay, then 
you are a PhD student, right? <laughs> 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 I, I, as I said initially, I plan to use mechanisms in one way or the other, and I was hoping for yeah, more explanations from today and better understanding, which I think did happen. So uh, I see that the field is broader and more complicated than I thought. Um, I read so that. have you been disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the, the panel achieved its purpose. Because we're not here to simplify things and give easy answers. And I guess it's interesting to see how there are these parallel streams of research and how they overlap partly. I think that the underlying goal of being a qualitative researcher and still being able to do rigorous research and have results that are a bit more generalizable is very good and useful. And I, I'm sure and I hope that everybody got some ideas on how to go about it and you're going to carry it into the outside world. And PhD students, you can answer my question in your methodology chapter. <laughs> but first of all, let's give an extra round of applause to our panelists. Thank you for coming.